Time to begin this evening. Take a song book and turn to 222. 222. After the one song, uh, please stand. I'm going to ask uh, Steve, if he will, to word our closing prayer. Or I mean, opening prayer. Sorry. 222. Please <laughs> Oh, I love this 
shaken, O my Lord, Lord, to be friends I had first thought that we were finished with the uh, chimney corner scripture, and uh, then there was another another one that was suggested, and so I wrote this. And then uh, it's a little bit different than what we've been discussing because I'm just going to read through the article, and then down at the bottom it says uh, discuss the subject of euphemisms, and we've done that uh, before. I preached on it, and we talked about uh, using kind of slang language, and we'll have to be more careful with the language that we use, and uh, certainly not use God's name in vain, but uh, certain words like gosh and G and those uh, are derivatives uh, of divinity of God and so we need to kind of refrain from doing those. But rather than discussing that, uh, I thought that uh, we'd just talk about Jehoshaphat and so I'll get to that in the latter part of our study tonight. But uh, there's passages there that are mentioned here on the board for those of you uh, who are live streaming and don't have access to the article. Uh, these are some scriptures that you can look at and follow along with. Uh, this, as I said, uh, is an addendum to the original Chimney Corner Scripture series. In all pr uh, practicality, this could be a nearly inexhaustive list, and I think this one to be the last. So uh, I promise you that this will be the last one. <laughs> um, from where does the expression Jump and Jehoshaphat come? Uh, it possibly has its origins in the 19th, 19th century, but the details are somewhat vague. This mild oath first appeared in a novel from 1866 when a cowboy backwoodsman used it to convey his surprise and admiration at how far a horse and its beautiful rider had jumped. He says, by the jumping Jehoshaphat, what a girl. She ain't she are sure enough. Uh, it later became a favorite saying of cartoon cowboy Yosemite Sam, uh, the adversary of Bugs Bunny. Uh, Jumping Jehoshaphat and just plain Jehoshaphat originated in the United States during the 19th century craze for minced oaths, uh, pseudo swear words that replaced profane or blasphemous words with inoffensive ones. And that's where we got what I was saying a while ago, the euphemisms uh, coming or stemming from uh, God, for, for instance, uh, G is short for Jesus. Uh, and we, we use those, uh, but perhaps don't understand the, the, uh, how profound that is. Uh, these not quite uh, oaths could be rather poetic. Uh, they rhyme. For example, holy moly. I used alliteration, jumping Jupiter. And we're fun to say, uh, G. Willikers, jumping Jehoshaphat, follows suit. The Jehoshaphat in question is the biblical king of Judah. It might seem odd to refer to him as jumping since he is best known for standing still. In 2 Chronicles, Judah is threatened with invasion. Jehoshaphat and his people pray to God for help. The Lord tells them from chapter 20, verses 15 and 17 of 2 Chronicles, the battle is not yours, but God's. 
Take your position, stand still, and see the victory of the Lord on your behalf. That's from the New Revised Standard Version. The Judeans emerge victorious, and one might not expect the steadfast Jehoshaphat to begin leaping around, so jumping Jehoshaphat might carry extra force, meaning something as, I'm as surprised as if King Jehoshaphat started jumping. That's all just speculation. Don't know for sure. Uh, look at it another way. Jehoshaphat and jumping go hand in hand. Uh, the king appoints men to sing and to praise God as the soldiers march to meet their enemies. Such prayer may well have involved leaping and dancing, since leaping is associated with joy and the praise of God across the Bible. In the Song of Solomon, the beloved comes leaping upon the mountains, bounding over the hills. In Song of Solomon chapter 2 and verse 8. David uses the metaphor of jumping to credit God for his success. In Psalms 18, 29, by, by my God, I can leap over a wall. And Christ Jesus tells his followers that if the world curses them, they should rejoice and leap for joy, for their reward is great in heaven. Luke chapter 6, verse 23. One of the Greek words the New Testament uses for rejoicing is agiao, which comes from roots that mean literally much and jump. If I had to choose the expression's most likely origin, I'd say that 19th century Americans were trying to trying out different words for mild oaths, and that jump Jehoshaphat was both appropriately biblical and fun to say. Uh, using slang expressions are often steeped in euphemisms, and as I said, that define a mild or indirect word or expression substituted for one considered to be too blasphemous, harsh, or insensitive when referring to something unpleasant, unpleasant or embarrassing. One needs to be careful that irreligious statements are not meant or intended when such phrases are used. So, as one of the girls at the uh, coffee shop this morning said, a penny for your thoughts. And it, this didn't cost you anything, but uh, I would ask for a penny for your thoughts. That's a penny for my thoughts. And I just put them on paper. So, uh, the question was asked this afternoon about Jehoshaphat that did you know, and as I said in the article, he's better known for standing still rather than jumping about. But this is what happens in chimney corner scripture when somebody says, uses that type of language and without any research. Uh, so there, there it is um, for what it's worth. Comments or questions you have? I'll take that a little, a little uh, not direct, but just something for our culture and listen to that. Second Chronicles uh, twenty, what uh, verse seventeen? Mm -hmm. uh, and the first part of it goes, you know, you will you will not need to fight the battle. Present yourselves, uh, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord. And I was trying to look the other way. There are just two places in the Bible that says something like that when God gets ready to take action. It'd be here, and then when they were when they was. Uh, in Egypt, wasn't it? When they when they when he parted the sea, wasn't something like that? Well, there's some passages that say, "Be still and know that I am God." But I mean, these were in action. Though. I mean, like he's like, getting ready to do something big. Okay, I don't know whether just two or not. Uh, okay, I, I didn't know. I would just I would just have to be thinking that. Yeah, yeah, I, I can't answer the question. I don't know. Any other thought? Yeah, well, as I said, just take it for what it's worth. If you want to take notes, you can turn it over and write on the back of this because the rest of this, I'm going to uh, lecture more or less. Um, for older folks who watch Bugs Bunny cartoons, you remember the infamous Yosemite Sam. Uh, Jumping Jehoshaphat was a euphemism, as we just mentioned here, or mild oath. Um, now, as I said, from where does the expression come? It uh, possibly has its origins, as we said, in the 19th century. 1866, and I just read you all that. Uh, but what does the Bible say about King Jehoshaphat? Uh, we're not making light of it. We're not trying to use it as a euphemism. We're not going to use it as slang words necessarily. Uh, but again, it's one of those that people, you, you hear them say it, and they say, well, that's, that's in the Bible. No, it isn't. Uh, but it, it provided me an opportunity to do some research and some study on King uh, Jehoshaphat. And so I thought I'd share some of these things with you this evening. So anytime you have a, a comment, uh, most of the outline I have up here is on the board, and I'm not going to give it one light at a time, but several lines at once, so you can copy them down if you want to, or you have uh, 
more opportunity to study it later. As I said, you can write uh, on the back of your sheet, or if you need some more paper, we've got that. But who was Jehoshaphat? Well, he's the fourth king of Judah, uh, the son of Asa. Asa was one of those uh, beloved men who did right in the sight of God for most of his life, and uh, then followed by Jehoshaphat, his son. His mother was Azubah, the daughter of Shilhai, of whom nothing further is, is known. We don't know any more about her than just her name mentioned there. Uh, he was 35 years old uh, when he ascended to the throne, and he reigned 25 years. And this was, so historians tell us, about 873 to 849 B.C. So we're talking uh, over 800 years before Christ. Uh, the history of his reign is contained in 1 Corinthians 20, or 1, 1 Kings 22, 41 through 50, and in 2 Chronicles 17, 1 through 21 at verse 1. And again, we uh, may we read some of these phrases to go through in order to get through this rather quickly this evening. I'm not going to uh, read all of the text. As I said, I'll bring, uh, read some of it from time to time. The narrative in 1 Kings 22, uh, 1 through 35a, and then in 2 Kings 3, 4, belongs to the history of the northern kingdom. Now remember, we talk about the divided kingdom. You had the ten tribes of the northern kingdom, and they were ruled by Jeroboam. You had the two tribes of, of the south ruled by Rehoboam. And so what we're seeing here is the first king's account uh, and the second king's 3-4 belong to the history of the northern kingdom. Uh, and you know that Jeroboam was the one who said he would put a, a, an idol in, uh, for them to worship. They wouldn't have to go back to Jerusalem. That one in uh, Dan and one in uh, Beersheba or Bethel, which was it? Uh, see, one, one down in, one in Dan and one in Bethel, I think it was. Uh, so, so they wouldn't have to go back. Those, that was the ruling of the ten northern tribes. This is kind of the, the beginning of all of this. So the reign of Jehoshaphat appears to have been one of unusual religious activity. And I, I found this rather intriguing. Is why I kind of want to just preach a sermon tonight only. I want it to be in class form because it give you a chance to stop me and say whatever you want. But there are so many parallels and contrasts with our society today. And I want to emphasize these as we go through. Uh, it, it may have been religious, uh, but it was... Uh, Characterized not so much by religious measures, that was, we're talking about the northern kingdom now, as it was by the religious spirit that pervaded every act of the king. So, uh, inheriting this attitude from his father Asa, uh, Jehoshaphat begins carrying out some of these things. And he sought the favor of Jehovah uh, in every detail of his life. He was, he was committed. And that was the kind of king that uh, you know God considered the people said, we want a king. And he said, I'll give you a king, but you, you're not going to like it. But I'll grant it to you. Well, this was the attitude. Uh, in 2 Chronicles 17, 3, uh, it says, And Jehovah was with Jehoshaphat because he walked in the first ways of his father David and sought not unto the Balaam. In 17, 4, he says, But sought to the God of his father and walked in his commandments and not after the doings of Israel. So he evidently felt that a nation's character is determined by its religion. That's a far cry from what we hear today. But accordingly, he made it his duty to purify what was then national worship. So here was the king who said, if we're going to have the kind of nation that God wants, we're going to have to be a religious nation, a godly nation. And we had at one time... a country that was built upon a foundation of godly principles. But those are decaying and have for the past several decades. And we are winding up with what we have today. Most interestingly, the uh, Sodomites, those of Sodom and Gomorrah, those who practice immorality in the worship in the temple, were banished from this land. In 1 Kings 22 at verse 46, and the remnant of the Sodomites, just the remnant. You remember this was back in Genesis, the 19th chapter, where you have this with uh, Sodom, the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. But now we're into 1 Kings 22, 46, and he says the remnants, that is the ancestry that would come down, those uh, are the prodigy of those that have been ancestors. The remnant of the Sodomites that remain in the days of his father Asa, he put away out of the land. 
If you weren't going to be religious, if you weren't going to worship God, if you didn't want to do this the way the king says to do it, and he was doing it the way God said to do it, then you're out of here. And so he drove them out of the land. We're seeing illegal immigration. People brought in. No holes barred. No restrictions. No restraints. Just, you know, and I understand that's how we took over this country. <laughs> and you look at it two ways. But what I'm talking about is when you have people that are engaged in sodomy, you don't have a festival in Spencer, Indiana and celebrate being perverts. And so, and uh, Jehoshaphat would not have tolerated that. And so, I, as I said, I'm, I'm showing some difference here uh, and some parallels. Uh, the Asherim were taken out of were taken out of Judah in Second Chronicles 17, verse six and 19:3. The Bible says, "The people from Beersheba to the hill country of Ephraim were brought back into Yahweh, that is to God, the God of their fathers." Second Chronicles 19, verse four. Now, because of Jehoshaphat's zeal for God. He was rewarded with power. 2 Chronicles 17 and verse 5 says, the riches and honor in abundance. The whole verse says, therefore Jehovah established the kingdom in his hand and all Judah brought to Jehoshaphat tribute and he had riches and honor in abundance. And this is kind of like Jesus talks about in John the 10th chapter where he is saying that he is giving us an abundance, an abundant life, not just life, but an abundant life. And then believing that religion and morals were best for the kingdom that he was overseeing, that civilization was suffering from ignorance. They weren't, a lot of them weren't listening to him. And Jehoshaphat introduced a system of public instruction and a whole educational system. He was kind of the first one to set up what we would call today the educational system of schools and school teachers. In this, what I've learned with regard to the structure, he appointed a commission, and that commission was composed of princes, Levites, and priests, religious people he put in charge of seeing to their education. And they would go from city to city to instruct the people. Now remember, he, they were ignorant, and they chose to remain ignorant. But the king says, we're not going to stay ignorant. I'm going to send out teachers, tutors, if you please, that are going to instruct you and enlighten you on the word of God and try to reestablish the morality and what God would want us to do. And so their instruction was to be based on the, the one true foundation of sound morals, health, healthy religious life. Second Chronicles 17, verses 7 and 9, concerning the book of the law of Jehovah. He says, also in the third year of the reign, he's of his reign, he sent his princes, even Ben Hail and Obadiah and Zechariah and Neth uh, Nethanel and Micaiah to teach, to teach in the cities of Judah. So why did he send these men out? To teach religious instruction. You can't teach God and religion in schools today. That's one thing wrong with the nation. But we're seeing this was a system that was ordained, appointed by King Jehoshaphat back in 800 years before Christ. And so at 2 Chronicles 17, 8, and with them, that is the ben Hale and the Obadiah and the Zechariah and all the others, with them the Levites, even Shemaiah and Nethaniah and Zebediah and Ashiel and Shemaramoth and Jehonathan and Adonijah and Tobijah and Tob Adonijah, the Levites, and with them Elishama and Jehoram, the priests. And they taught in Judah, having the book of the law of Jehovah with them. And they went about through all the cities of Jehovah and taught among the people. Now can you imagine having a country where the main focus is on a foundation of religion and a foundation of morals? And you send out religious folks to instruct the people? And if you don't like it, you can get out of the country. In fact, we'll drive you out of the country. Because this is God's plan. Now, we oftentimes say history repeats itself. And this today, to me, in my opinion, is exactly what was taking place back then. And the leadership, the king, saw uh, fit to rectify the problem, not add to it. So here's uh, several things for you to think about as we've looked at these 
first few points. Uh, and along with that, if we go to the next slide, not only did Jehoshaphat introduce public education, but he also implemented a, a system of public instruction, which we just saw. This was for the better administration of justice. And he appointed judges to preside over common pleas court. These were established in all the fortified cities of Judah. In addition to these local courts, we're told that two courts of appeal, an ecclesiastical and a civil court, were established in Jerusalem to be presided over by priests, Levites, and leading nobles as judges. Now think about that. Look at what we call the liberal judges of this day. Look what they are sanctioning. Look what they are doing. Listen to what they are saying. And you see, they are diametrically opposed to what Jehoshaphat taught and instructed, even from a standpoint of judges. We, I'm not don't mean to condemn all judges. But I'm saying that they're not the right, most of them are not the right type of people, at least compared to those of Jehoshaphat's day, to even hold the office of a judge. Because most of them are not concerned about religion, they're not concerned about God. They're, they're just concerned, I'm not sure what they're concerned about, I wouldn't second guess. But at the head of the religious court of appeal was the high priest and a secular person. So he was giving them the benefit of the doubt. If you went before the judge, there was a priest, you knew he was going to be religious, and then with him there was a secular person, that is a non-religious person. Not that he was an atheist, but he wasn't the one for teaching religion. And so Jehoshaphat said, if you're going to bring your cases before the court, you're going to appear before judges that are godly and give you the benefit of the doubt. We'll even have a secular person standing there that will work with this judge to make the proper decisions. The ruler of the house of Judah uh, means that he headed the civil court of appeal in 2 Chronicles 19, verses 4 through 11. Here I'm going to read a few verses to you. Uh, 2 Chronicles 19, beginning at verse 4. And Jehoshaphat dwelt in Jerusalem, and he went out again among the people from Beersheba to the hill country of Ephraim, and brought them back unto Jehovah, the God of their fathers. And he sent judges in the land throughout all the fortified cities of Judah, city by city, and said to the judges, Consider what you do. He pointed to judges, but he says, Consider them. These are their instructions. Consider what you're doing. For you judge not man, but for Jehovah. And he is with you in the judgment. Now therefore, let the fear of Jehovah be upon you. Take heed and do it, for there is no iniquity with Jehovah our God, nor respect of persons, nor making of, or taking of bribes. Isn't that interesting? Verse 8, moreover in Jerusalem did Jeho Jehoshaphat set of the Levites and the priests and of the heads of the fathers' houses of Israel for the judgment of Jehovah and for controversies. You have a problem? You have controversy, conflict? There's a judge here to take care of that. They returned to Jerusalem. Verse 9, he charged them saying, Thus shall you do in the fear of Jehovah faithfully and with a perfect heart and whensoever any controversy shall come to you from your brethren that dwell in their cities between blood and blood, between law and commandment, statutes and ordinances, you shall warn them that they be not guilty towards Jehovah, and so wrath come upon you and upon your brethren. This do, and ye shall not be guilty. Now, from 800 B.C. to about 60, or around 60 A.D., we make a big jump. And what we have learned here in 800 B.C., Paul deals with about 60 A.D. when he writes to the church of Christ in Corinth. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, what's one of the things that he forbids there? Taking a brother to court. It was the same thing that was back in Jehoshaphat's day. Paul is dealing with it again with the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And so he is warning us, do not take work, work this out among yourselves. And so this was the same philosophy, the same directive that God had given to Jehoshaphat, was now giving to Paul the apostle, and we should be following the same thing today. <clears throat> he says at verse 10, uh, uh, verse 11, And behold, Amariah, the chief priest, is over you in all matters of Jehovah. And Zebediah, the son of Ishmael, 
the ruler of the house of Judah, in all the king's matters, also the Levites shall be officers before you. Deal courageously, and jo Jehovah be with the good. So the insistence that a judge was to be in character like God, with whom he says there is no iniquity, nor respect of persons, nor taking of bribes, that was back in verse 7 of this St. Chronicles 19, is noteworthy. Because it fits so well as being what we should have today, and we don't have it. And I think it's, it's rather obvious as we see this. Let me stop there for just a moment in all that I've said and preached to you the first several minutes and uh, see if you have any input or if there's anything you want to say that uh, might add to the lesson. I I'll notice one thing when you heard him do this last segment here. Uh, down here for seven. And there, uh, now therefore let the fear of the Lord be upon you. Take care and do it. For there is no inequity. And that means no sin or uncleanness, right? Basically. Okay. Uh, there's no partiality nor taking the bribes, okay? And I was just thinking and just proved that God has changed He's, uh, from the time of the king to the yeah. New Testament time. There's a cross-reference cross there from over to Acts 10, 34. Yeah. And then Peter opened his mouth and said, In truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality in the verse 35, but in every nation, whoever fears Him, uh, and worst righteousness is accepted by you. So right. to me, that just that, that shows the continuality. Sure. Sure. Good point. Uh, and more to the point with the whole fan, I mean he was he was doing these things too then. Okay. <laughs> Um, continuing on then with this slide, uh, according to 2 Chronicles 17.2, he began his reign with uh, defensive measures against Israel. In verse 17 and verse 13, he built castles and cities of supplies to the land of Judah. The Bible says that he had many works. And they, they've learned uh, even archaeological findings that uh, these works were, as I said, amounted to the castles, the supply cities and all this. And he appears to have had a, a large standing army. Uh, including a cavalry. In uh, 1 Kings 22.4 and 2 Chronicles 17.14, the Bible says, And this was the numbering of them according to their father's houses, of Judah the captains of thousands, Adna the captain, and with him mighty men of valor, 300,000. Now we should note that the numbers in 2 Chronicles 17.14 uh, may seem impossible, uh, and that's been debated for centuries. Should this be 300,000 or not? Uh, one plausible thought is that the scribe recording this section didn't have access to the original numbers and maybe thought that the names back in verse 8 uh, is, is the basis for this. But again, that's speculation. We can't say that the Bible says, as far as our record is concerned, that there were 300,000. But I just mentioned in passing there are those that would question that. But be that as it may, however many he had, evidently it was quite a cavalry, uh, quite an army. Um, and we had... Uh, with all the godliness and, and security at, at home, uh, were followed by respect and, and peace abroad. In other words, the, when people see what America is doing, it has an influence on their country, whether it's Europe or Asia or India, wherever it might be. Theoretically, that's the way it should be. So the people saw the moral standards and the godliness and the security of the homeland, and they said, we need to be more like them. That's the way it should work. The Philistines and the Arabians brought tribute in 2 Chronicles 17 and verse 11. And some of the Philistines brought Jehoshaphat presents and silver for tribute. The Arabians also brought him flocks, 7,700 rams and 7,700 he goats to Jehoshaphat. Uh, in 1 Kings 22 47, we learned that Edom had no king. But they, had a, they did have a deputy, and he possibly was appointed by Jehoshaphat. If that were so, then Jehoshaphat held the autonomy, that is, he was the head uh, over the nations and tribes that were bordering Judah on the south and the west. So again, this is uh, going into just some of these phrases from 1 Kings 22, 47, that if Edom didn't have a king, perhaps... Uh, there was a deputy that had been appointed, and if that's the case, 
that would have spread the borders of what uh, Jehoshaphat was doing as far as his authority was concerned. Uh, now, holding that authority over the, the weaker nations and being allied with the stronger, uh, Jehoshaphat secured the peace uh, for most of his reign in First Chronicles 17 at verse 10. And as from that day, and as from the day that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel, and I will subdue all thine enemies. Moreover, I will tell thee that Jehovah will build thee a house that furthered the uh, internal development of the kingdom. And in contrast to the former kings uh, of, Je of Judah, Jehoshaphat saw uh, greater benefit in a coalition with Israel than the civil war. Now, here's where he starts getting into trouble. Uh, and sometimes if you compromise, if you're a leader, and rather than taking a stand for that which is right, if you begin to compromise even a little bit, it's not always, I'm not saying it's it never good, but I'm saying it's not always good because certain things are going to be given up. So accordingly, the old feud between the two kingdoms, First uh, Kings 14 and 30, there was war between Rehoboam and Jeroboam continually. And we're back to where I started with the divided kingdom and talking about Jeroboam in the north, Rehoboam in the south. And so they were constantly at war, 1 Kings 14.30. Then at 1 Kings 15.6, there was war between Rehoboam and Jeroboam. All the days of his life was dropped. So Jehoshaphat made peace with Israel. In 1 Kings 22 at verse 44, Jehoshaphat made peace with the king of Israel. And this political union, as it were, was cemented by the marriage of Jehoram, Jehoshaphat's son, to my most unfavoritest grandmother of all times, Athaliah. Remember, she was the one that had all her grandchildren killed so that she could take authority, take the throne. So this is where the beginning of this downfall occurred. Uh, the, as I said, the, the marriage between uh, Jehoram, uh, Jehoshaphat's son, and Athaliah, she was the daughter of Ahab and Jezebel. Very few people named their son Ahab and very few named their son their daughter Jezebel. And there's a reason for that. And, and this is, you see the ancestry now and now you're going to see the prodigy as it goes on into the future. And it all started with Jehoshaphat and his son marrying a woman that he should not have married. As I said, uh, over in 2 Chronicles 22 at verse 10, uh, Athaliah was the grandmother who killed all the grandchildren except one. The Bible says, Now when Athaliah, the mother of Ahaziah, saw that her son was dead, she arose and destroyed all the seed royal of the house of Judah. Killed all the grandkids. Can you imagine doing that? And yet it all kind of started when Jehoshaphat started compromising and eventually led to a bad marriage which led to the downfall uh, of the seed royal as the Bible says in 2 Chronicles 22 at verse 10. Now shortly after this marriage, Jehoshaphat joined Ahab uh, in a crusade against Syria. And this is written about in 2 Chronicles 18, 1 through 32. And just a few verses of that, beginning at verse 1, 2 Chronicles 18. Now Jehoshaphat had riches and honor in abundance, and he joined affinity with Ahab. And after certain years, he went down to Ahab to Samaria, and Ahab killed sheep and oxen for him in abundance, and for the people that were with him, and moved him to go up with him to Ramoth Gilead. And Ahab, king of Israel, said unto Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, Wilt thou go with me to Ramoth Gilead? And he answered him, I am as thou art, and my people as thy people, and we will be with thee in the war. And so he made an alliance with the wrong guy, the wrong person, the wrong nation. And it appears that Jehoshaphat really held, for lack of a better term, I just put this down as inferior position in this campaign. I mean, here he had been king and done all these wonderful things, but as soon as he is friends now with the enemy, Ahab and Jezebel, he takes an inferior position, a lower position, giving up some of his power. At 1 Kings 22 and verse 4, And he said unto Jehoshaphat, Wilt thou go with me to battle to Ramoth Gilead? So he says, In view of the military service uh, rendered to Jehoram in 2 Kings 3 and verse 4, 
Now Mesha, king of Moab, was a sheep master, and he rendered unto the king of Israel the wool of a hundred thousand lambs and of a hundred thousand rams. So Judah seems to have become a dependency uh, of Israel. And nevertheless, the union may have contributed to the welfare and prosperity of Judah. And it may have enabled Jehoshaphat to hold the independence over the neighboring nations that we talked about a while ago, if he indeed had appointed deputies out here. Uh, but the outcome of the alliance with the house of Omri uh, was disastrous for Judah. And I said, one thing leads to another. Once you hook up, make an alliance with the enemy, and he has ulterior motives, and you're willing to buckle or not stand your ground, you're more than likely headed for trouble. So the introduction into Judah of Baal worship more than offset any political and material advantage that was gained in the uh, succeeding reigns, the ones that the kings that came after, the, it, it indirectly led to, to the almost total extinction of the royal family of Judah. Uh, remember in 2 Kings 11, 1, when Athaliah, the mother of Ahaziah, saw that her son was dead, she arose and destroyed all the seed royal. And so despite the rebuke of the prophet Jehu for his journey with Ahab, uh, so helping the wicked in 2 Chronicles 19.2, the Bible says, that, And Jehu, the son of Hanai, the seer, went out to meet him and said to King Jehoshaphat, Shouldest thou help the wicked and love them that hate Jehovah? For this thing wrath is upon thee from before Jehovah. So Jehovah entered a similar alliance with Jehoram of Israel. In 2 Kings 3, 4, Now Mesha, king of Moab, was a sheep master, and he rendered unto the king of Israel the wool of 100,000 lambs and 100,000 uh, rams. So here's the, again another alliance that he's beginning to uh, dwindle down his power. He's beginning to decay. And on the invitation of Jehoram to join him in, in this expedition against uh, Moab, Jehoshaphat was ready with the same speech of acceptance as in the case with Ahab. It says in 2 Kings 3, 7, And he went and sent to Jehoshaphat the king of Judah, saying, The king of Moab hath rebelled against me. Wilt thou go with me against Moab to battle? And he said, I will go up. I am as thou art. My people is thy people. My horses as thy horses. And we compare that in the 2 Kings 3, 7 to what was said back in 1 Kings 22, 4. He said to Jehoshaphat, Go with me to Ramoth Gilead. Now we're going to another place to do battle. And, and with another king, and the situation just gets worse and worse. So Jehoshaphat died at the age of 60. And Josephus says that he was buried in a magnificent... Jeho Josephus wrote about 100 AD, uh, that 100 years, about uh, 60, 70 years after Christ. Uh, so he, again, is just a historian. It's not inspired language, but it's, it's historical record. And uh, a lot of scholars refer to Josephus. And he says that Jehoshaphat was buried in a magnificent manner. He had imitated the actions of David. And the king was left to Jehoram, uh, who inaugurated the beginning of his reign by causing the massacre of his brethren. So, as I said, in all of this this evening, we have tried to point out that even though Jehoshaphat isn't necessarily, or it isn't, not just necessarily, but isn't in the scriptures, there are still various things about Jump Jehoshaphat that you can iron out on your own. But Jehoshaphat himself is an interesting study. And I really went lickety-split through it this evening because I didn't want to draw this out into two lessons. Um, because even though I'm interested in it, it may have been boring to you. And that oftentimes happens when you get into the Old Testament. And, and others appreciate it. But uh, I wanted to get this in as, as I said, one last chimney corner scripture. But I wanted to just kind of share with you uh, Jehoshaphat because he's one of those kind of forgettable characters. You know, he kind of gets lost back there in the Old Testament and all those pages. And there are just so many parallels, uh, some contrast. But we see what's happening uh, today uh, was very much like what was happening back then. It's a, some of the same pitfalls, some of the same alliances, some of the same treaties, uh, some of the uh, things that just lead us further and further away from God. We've got about five minutes left. Any comments or questions that uh, you want to say? I'm yeah. thinking uh, well, the first passage you read here, what the, is that in chapter 20? 
Oh my, I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I think it was, but uh, yeah, 2015, 17. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, Same and we, we talked about, you know, we're in such a stand, you know, stand still basically with the salvation of the Lord. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that was almost the contract to jump into your I mean, he was told, you, you don't have to do anything here. Just, right. just kind of stand there, you know. So, I mean, not really important, maybe, but it just kind of crossed my mind. Well, yeah, and that, that's what I was saying that. He is noted for standing still. But Jump Jones that would tie in if this is where this phrase comes from, that it was the idea of jumping for joy. And so, you know, when a king would think he'd go right and doing things for God, that he would be praising God and there was he would be jumping for joy for that. that. That's just an idea. I was kind of I had kind of the same yeah. thought time. Yeah. Where it comes yeah. From. And we can't back with Luke chapter and verse, but neither can you for can you find a phrase to jump to that in the Bible? So, I mean, really, yeah. because compared to a lot of the kings, he was, he was really on par for doing a lot yeah. of work. Oh, yeah. Yeah, for a long time. And, and to do all this before he died at 60, that's quite a tough Tracy? Oh, what did he die of? Uh, I don't know either. I don't know either. Yeah, I was reading it, it just said that he went and rested with his fathers. But that's kind of a young age, isn't it? I mean, that's that two more years, and I'm going to be there. <laughs> you know? Oh, I passed that 50 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> it's only you know, 60. Out. Yeah. No, I really don't know, and I don't know what the average age was at that time. You know, in the beginning, there were, there were hundreds of years, and then later, not so long. <coughs> most of the kings reigned for like 40 years from David and Solomon. And all of this. So, uh, age wise, I don't have any idea of what he died of. Huh. Okay. Didn't think it really it says there at the end of chapter 20, because you have allied yourself with ASI, the Lord uh, has destroyed your work. Don't say what it's about. Yeah. Yeah, it's close. Well, as I said, I went through it rather quickly, and I'm sure you've down any notes that you wanted to take and study on it yourself. But I, I've just, as I said, it took a few days <laughs> to get this together, and it was just intriguing to me uh, to see uh, the way history repeats itself. Uh, I want to share it with you in this last class on changing point of Scripture. Next week, the Lord's willing, uh, we'll begin a, a new study uh, with regard to what's called a, a cancel culture. And uh, we'll go into uh, what the Bible has to say about what happened to the early Christians uh, and what's happening to people today who are religious and who want to stand up for God. And we'll have a few studies on that. And I've got a whole list of... Uh, slides to present for that also. So we'll take a few weeks and, and study that. Uh, cancel culture. Maybe a phrase that you've heard people use, don't know what it means. So we'll try to define that. Nothing else, we ring the bell.
there's a section of the Sermon on the Mount that uh, will serve as our invitation tonight. Uh, you see this, the application of the golden rule. We are kind, polite, helpful, and aware of others' feelings. We listen carefully to others without interrupting them. We look after our own and other people's belongings. We try to best work hard, try our best to work hard and learn from our mistakes. We treat other people the way we would like to be treated, and we always tell the truth. Now, this was a list, obviously, that was handed out to school children um, uh, or people, you know, younger people, trying to teach them the, the golden rule. Uh, but we, we think about what this is really saying. If you go to uh, Matthew, the uh, seventh chapter, and beginning at verse 7, he says, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks it will be opened. Or what man is there among you who, when his son asks for a loaf, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, he will not give him a snake, will he? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give what is good to those who ask him? In everything, therefore, treat people the same way you want them to treat you, for this is the law and the prophets. And it's that last verse that we concentrate on as far as the golden rule is concerned. But look at verses 7 through 11 that I just read. You'll see that those things are, that are on the screen there are listed in this passage. And so the individual this evening who is wanting to think about his relationship with God is looking to a father that is going to give you the very best blessings he has. He's not going to give you something, uh, not a bait and switch situation but he's going to give you the quality blessing that you deserve. And he's willing to give his son to die in your behalf, to sacrifice his body and to shed his blood that you might have an opportunity for salvation. So the avenue of prayer, this is to Christians that we are to ask and the Lord will give to us to seek. We will find, knock, and it will be open to you. And the opportunity uh, tonight is open unto anyone who wants to render obedience uh, unto God. So as you consider your own relationship with the Lord, you need to respond to His invitation and think about the principles that are mentioned here in the Golden Rule and this text of Matthew 7, verses 7 through 12. We hope that you will respond by obeying, obeying Him this evening. Will you come as together we stand and sing? Um,
we've had this evening we ask your richest blessings on us as we part one from another and go to our separate homes in christ's name we pray amen